Hey, we're going to have a, a quick demonstration of how to build a graphic organizer so we can use that to try to handle or manage some of these, these vocabulary words that, uh, that I think are going to be really helpful when we talk about slavery, we talk about the events leading up to the Civil War, and this will be good stuff. But we're going to start off by building something here. When I say building something, we're going to, we're going to do a little origami. We're going to take our paper and we're going to fold it just like this called hamburger style okay so it was a long way it would have been hot dog but this is hamburger now I'm gonna take this paper I'm gonna fold it over so it looks like I've got a box all right and then I'm just gonna take this corner flip it over and the crease is gonna to be to my right hand the crease is gonna be up towards that way and I should be able to take my left fingers and put it here right inside. Now all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this corner, the one with my left hand is holding, and I'm gonna fold it down just like this. Perfect. I got a diamond, or I've got a diamond, or I've got a boat, or a hat, whatever you wanna call it. Now if I unfold this paper just like this, this is what I'm going to get, a paper like that. Now, I went ahead and, and did one earlier. And when I did the one earlier, I took the lines that I had drawn, and I made them into a compartments so I can put information in. This is a graphic organizer I can use. To kind of coach up on this, we'll start right here with this one. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my pen. I'm going to make a little tick mark here. A little tick mark there see where I did those right where those triangles are and I'm going to give myself a half circle or half an egg I'd call it half an egg so it looks like an egg not a circle something the Easter Bunny would like and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to draw out these beautiful lines oh, don't forget this line don't want to be lonely. Okay, now I've got eight different compartments I can use and I can fill this information in. And if you don't want eight, you can fold it and do you can do it a way to do six, you can do four, you can do whatever you want, but eight works out pretty good this collaboration. And if you don't want to even have to be honest with you, as long as you have a point in the middle and you have these eight different creases, you're, it's gonna work out because you can make your circle in the center. But this particular circle looks like an egg and I'm gonna label this south because if I talk about the north, I'm gonna talk about different things. I'm gonna talk about industrialization. I'm gonna talk about things like factories and immigration and, and, and stuff like that and textile industries and interchangeable parts. Well, in the south, we're gonna focus more on things that are agriculture oriented. And specific, we talk about agriculture, we have to use the term king cotton. And king cotton really describes a mindset that the South had about themselves. They believed that cotton industry, industry was so important that nobody would let it fail. And it made them really cocky, it gave them a huge, huge ego. And that led to this idea that the world could not survive without them. And it enabled them to say, you know what, we're going to start our own country because we can. We can do whatever we want. We got King Cotton. So let's talk about the specific big term that has to come into play when we talk about cotton industry. It's slavery. And I want to make sure you understand the North and the South, they were both benefiting from slavery. Even though slavery was illegal in many parts of the North, they were still benefiting from the cotton production and then the stuff coming from the South. But that's a whole different topic, okay? I really want to just get into these words. So when we, as you talk about the stuff in class or you read about it, or if you watch one of my little casts here, um, you'll understand these words and it'll make it, make it easier for you to follow along. So we're going to start with some words and we're going to work our way around the corner here. And I'm going to start with the word slave codes. It's actually a term, not a word. 
And slave codes, if you don't know what they are, they become really pre prevalent after the uh, Nat Turner revolt, and, and that's a different topic too. But Nat Turner was an escaped slave who uh, um, rose up with a, with a handful of other slaves, and they went on a killing spree in the South and really, really hammered home this idea of, of how terrifying it was. Um, the idea of having slaves out and about and, and what would happen to them if they got loose, that type of thing. And, and it led to a lot of different changes in the South, the way they treated slaves, but also some of their laws. And when we talk about codes, we're really talking about the word laws. We're not talking about secret codes that the Underground Railroad was using. That's a whole different term. That'd be like secret messages. Codes, in this case, is a law. Okay, I'm going to write this word right here. Your city has code, state has code. In this case, these are codes that were geared towards slavery. I'm gonna give you another term. If you don't know what a fugitive is, you're gonna learn in a few minutes. We'll talk about that. I got another term that's very important. That's called covert resistance. And once again, I'll explain that in a few minutes here. And along with covert, the opposite of covert is overt. And of course, this is a form of resistance too. And then we're gonna mention the Underground Railroad. Now, a lot of people know the Underground Railroad. They know that it existed but they get confused about what it actually was. It was not an actual railroad track where people uh, rode on trains. This was, this was something underground, this was secretive. It was very much covert, but in a way it was overt too, and, and I'll try to make that connection for you later on. And the next term I'm gonna bring up is emancipation. Then the term discrimination. And the last term I'm going to put on here is abolition. Okay, so let's do these one at a time. But I'm going to do something here. That I, I always like to do when I'm using these um, these images and stuff. I always try to use colors to help me out a little bit. And specifically when I'm looking at colors in the south, you better get used to color gray. Because gray is the signifying color that represents... the Confederate States. If we're gonna talk about the Union and the North, and we're gonna talk about anti-slavery, we'll use the color blue, because eventually that's the color they're gonna support and, and, and utilize. But for now, we're gonna focus on this color, which is the color blue, okay? And I'm gonna go through, and I'm gonna list what these words, I'm gonna give you definition. I'm gonna create some images here that help us make a little better connections to them, okay? So let's start with slave codes. These were laws that were passed by states. When I say states, I'm really talking about southern states to keep enslaved people from running away or rebelling. Okay, now, like I said, I like to give you little images. It's kind of hard to draw a law that people will recognize. So I just make a little document here. 
it kind of reminds me of of a document that somebody would have wrote in the old days. And I'm just going to scribble some stuff on here. I'm going to write the word law. And like I said, these were laws used to limit or control. Kind of looks like some toilet paper, but it's not. Okay, well, by our standards, they probably should have been. Okay, so let's go to the word fugitive. Now, if you didn't like these laws, these really restrictive laws, when I say slave codes, these were laws that limited your ability. You were no longer allowed to teach a slave to read or write. It might have limited how often they could get together, who they could get together with. It might have uh, uh, kept them from being allowed to have, have marriages. Whatever it was to, to dehumanize slaves and to keep them under control and keep them separated and uh, give them a tougher time to organize their thoughts and, and rally together and try to do something that would rebel against the slavery. That's what those codes were designed for. It's what they were all about, okay? And if things got really bad as a slave, it was really hard to fight back because you couldn't organize after the Nat Turner revolt. It was very difficult for you to get together with other slaves and come up with big plans like this. So as somebody who was tired of it, you might look at your only other option, which would be to, to run away. Now, I know for a fact that you have heard the term fugitive in other ways, in other conversations. And, and I know that because we talk about fugitives on the news sometimes. Uh, you, anytime in history you wanna go back and look at, there were fugitives from the law. Anytime you run away from an authority, that makes you a fugitive. Legally, if you run away, you're probably gonna have law enforcement after you. And slaves, they literally had slave catchers that would chase them down. Now I'm just drawing a little guy running. And it's like he's running fast, huh? And we're going to put him running right down a road. Okay. That reminds me that dude's taking off running. Now running is a very out in the open way to resist. Not everybody had the option of doing that, but if you were going to reach run away, that's, that's reference to overt resistance, just like it is fighting back. Overt resistance is obvious resistance. This is where you rebel in the open. So you openly just refuse to do something. Refuse to clean your room. I'm not doing it. You cross your arms, you sit down in the middle of the floor, you, you start pouting, whatever the case is. That's overt. If you walk out of class and just say, heck with it, I'm gone, that's overt. If you run away, that's overt. If you stand up and start swinging at somebody, that's that could be overt if, if they're trying to control you or manage you. And the way I try to remind people, because there's a difference between this and covert, and people get them mixed up a little bit. Think of something wide open. You open the door, Everybody can see what's going on inside. And that's a different than covert. Overt would be running away or, or fighting back, and, and people can see that. Covert resistance is much different. It's covered up. It's sneakier. It's hidden rebellion. This might be an example of um, slaves used to communicate through songs sometimes. And, and I hear this a lot where people think, oh, those were slave, clo slave codes because they were secret codes they would use. No, they might have been secret codes used by slaves, but they were not slave codes. Remember, slave codes is the term we use to, to describe laws that would control people of color. Covert resistance and using secret codes isn't quite the same thing as a slave code, okay? But people would use covert resistance. Maybe they'd work slowly. They'd fake injuries. Students do that all the time where they fake injuries and they have to, to go to the uh, um, nurse's office. And, oh, I got, I got a stomachache. Okay, they're really just trying to get out of class. And that happens sometimes. 
But anytime you're being sneaky, remember, you're kind of peeking through. But you can't really see out or people can't really see in. That would be covert. Okay. Why do I use these doors? Because they're the complete opposite. One's barely open, one's wide open. So I want to make sure you make those connections between the two of them because they are connected. And when I make connections like that, remember, I always like to use the color green when I make connections to things. I also like to use green when I'm talking about things that are, that are uh, um, progressing or growing or, or developing, right? And to be honest with you, you can use any color. Don't worry about green. Maybe I'll use blue later. I don't care. Let's go to our next term, though. Underground Railroad. Now, I know some of you know what Underground Railroad is, but I'm going to define it for you. Not because I don't think you know, but because I think it fits in good with these two. It's going to help me explain how these two work together to create Underground Railroads. Underground Railroad oops, was a system of people, white and black, people in the north and the south, that work together to help fugitive slaves escape to freedom. I'm a little worried. That my, there we go. That's a little better. It was on my blurriness there. I had uh, too blurry. Yeah, and for a picture of this, I'm going to, like I said, draw a couple slaves who are running away. This one's got some long legs. And I'm going to put railroad tracks under them, even though they weren't really railroad tracks. They were following a pathway. And, and usually underground railroads um, was a very, well, I shouldn't say usually, it was always a very organized process. They had uh, people who led slaves out of bondage or, or navigated them on the, the pathway to the north. And those people would be referred to as conductors. And if there were stopping points along the trip, they would stop and they would call those stations. And that's where people would hide. And keep in mind, just because you made it to the north didn't make you safe because you still had to find a way to get all the way up, sometimes Canada, before you were safe because of fugitive slave laws and stuff like that that compelled people in the north to cooperate with people trying to return slaves. So there's some information we got to consider that. Um, but we talk about overt and covert resistance. They were overtly escaping and running but they did it in a very sneaky, hidden fashion. The slaves were overt resisting or overtly resisting. The people helping them were doing it covertly so they could continue to keep on helping people. Does that make sense? Okay, I hope so. All right, emancipation. If you emancipate somebody, all that means is you're setting them free. Somebody gets emancipated from prison, they've been set free. Uh, you break up with somebody and you let them go do something else. Hey, you know what? You've both been emancipated. You can be emancipated from your parents early if you want to petition the courts. And, and there are some kids who do that, who become independent adults at the age of 17 or even 16 in some cases. So emancipation means more than just slavery. But in terms of this time period, the idea of emancipating slaves was extremely important to people who really, truly believed slavery was an evil thing. And it was also a horrible idea to people in the South who relied on slavery for their economy and, and for their way of life. I'm going to use a symbol for this. I'm going to draw a couple shackles.
Let's see if this makes sense. You know, like somebody broke the bonds that were holding somebody together. That's what emancipation is. Now, I have to be very honest and tell you, just because you believed in emancipation or just because you believed in freeing the slaves did not always meant that you believed that slaves were equal. And despite the fact that some people supported the idea of getting rid of slavery, they didn't always see people of color on the same level as they saw themselves. And so there is a lot of history in our country of policies or attitudes that deny equal rights. And although I think our country has come a very, very long way since the days of slavery, there still are times when you can be um, the victim of slavery, or excuse me, the victory of discrimination. And I also want to say not all discrimination is bad. Because sometimes we need discrimination to find out what's right for us. You know, I, I look at food and I'll discriminate uh, on a menu uh, on what the ingredients are because maybe I have allergies. So the term discrimination itself is not necessarily an evil word. It's how that word is used and how it's been used throughout history to deny rights to other people. That's when we get in trouble with discrimination. So I'm going to draw... This is kind of tricky to draw. Everybody catching what I'm doing here? I'm going to draw an equal sign here. So this is one of those signs you put up that don't say, don't do it, don't do it. Well, what you're saying with this sign is, and discrimination is, don't treat people equal. I'm not saying don't treat people equal. I'm just saying this symbol is to help you understand this term. All right, and we're going to go back to this little symbol in a second here because the last term we're going to talk about is getting rid of slavery. So where emancipation is being set free, abolition is the effort to eliminate or get rid of slavery. You can emancipate somebody and still have slavery in place. And emancipation may be one person at a time. Abolition is the idea of get everybody, emancipating everybody at one time. And so there was a strong force in the North that was developing throughout the 18, early 1800s. And many of these people were white, but some of these are escaped slaves who are coming to the North and, and enjoying the movements and, and using their firsthand knowledge to try to help people understand just how evil this institution was. And this movement was referred to as abolition. Now, if you want to use other words to kind of tie into this, the word abolish is to get rid of too, but abolition is the actual act of getting rid of slavery. Abolitionist is a person who wanted to get rid of slavery. Anytime you see the letters IST, you're referring to a person. So like a scientist is a person who studies science. An artist is somebody who does artwork. An abolitionist, IST, is somebody who wants to get rid of slavery. And the only symbol I have for this one, it's not even very original, And I could have wrote the word slavery on here. I could write the word slavery in here. I can put a couple of these, um, a couple of these bracelets in here. But the bottom line is, people want to end the practice of human bondage. Okay, so. Let's go back our words real quick here. We got the term slave codes. We got, and those are laws kept to keep people from running or rebelling. You've got fugitives who are the people who did escape. 
you've got overt and covert resistance, which are two different ways to, to fight back against people who are holding you in bondage. Sometimes we do this very openly, like fighting back or running away, but covert is something much more sneak or hidden. And these could be things like um, pretending to be sick or faking injuries or working slowly or, or playing stupid, things like that. And then of course you've got the Underground Railroad, which to be honest with you, in my opinion, is a great example of both of these terms. And then you've got the word emancipation. Emancipation is the idea of setting people free. Discrimination are policies that even though you believe in freedom doesn't mean you necessarily treat people equally. And then abolition is this, this whole big movement that was used to try to end the slavery in the South and, and all through the country actually. And an abolitionist is somebody who would have been one of those um, members of the abolition movement. Okay, now these are all terms that are going to help you get a better understanding of what we're going to deal with when we talk about the South, the slavery, and these other ideas that um, that tie in really well with this pre-Civil War stuff, and even after Civil War stuff, because there's still discrimination. There's still conversations on how to deal with freed slaves. There are still laws being put in place called Jim Crow laws and, and black codes that, that would have been used to limit these freed people. So these terms are they kind of repeat himself and come back and back just in slightly different forms. But this is a good start. And this will help us better understand the topic of uh, slavery in the South. Thank you very much.